This recording is going to cover the topic of tissue repair. Often in textbooks, you see tissue repair coupled with two vocabulary words, regeneration and fibrosis. Regeneration and fibrosis have something in common. Both of them involve the replacement of dead or damaged cells. But there is a difference between the two. Regeneration is going to replace dead or damaged cells with the same type of cell as before. In contrast, fibrosis replaces our dead and damaged cells with scar tissue. So regeneration is replacing dead or damaged cells with the same type of cells as before. Let's take an organ, say your liver, and if you damage your liver by mm, excessively drinking, then you are going to harm some of those cells in your liver. Your cells in your liver do detoxification, they uh, metabolize nutrients and make them ready for your body to use. You need those cells. So regeneration of those cells is going to replace your liver cells with liver cells. And this happens on a daily basis because cells become old, they die, they get damaged in the process of taking medicines and, and eating foods that might have some heavy metals in it, things like that. But if you drink heavily and for a very long time, you get something called cirrhosis of the liver. And in cirrhosis of the liver, your liver becomes increasingly fibrous because you're replacing your dead or damaged cells with scar tissue instead of with healthy cells that are meant to be in your liver. Because of this, fibrosis is going to result in diminished function of that tissue. Whereas regeneration is going to restore your tissue to normal function. Now that we understand the difference between regeneration and fibrosis, we are going to take a look at an example of tissue repair by looking at our skin. Please keep in mind that tissue repair occurs in other places besides your skin. We're just going to use our skin as an example. Here in our picture, we can see several things. The first thing I want you to notice is this pin is digging into our skin and it creates a hole. So our pin has penetrated through our epidermis and down into the dermis. Okay, we have breached our barrier. Now this picture divides us into about four different phases and we are going to look at tissue repair in about three phases of uh, tissue repair and books differ whether it's three or four but as long as all the information is there that's okay. Let's take a look at step one of tissue repair. In step one the very first thing that is going to occur is bleeding. So here we see our blood vessel has been breached and we see little droplets of blood running down our wound. So bleeding occurs immediately. Then we have these guys called mast cells. Our mast cells along with the damaged tissues and maybe some basophils are going to release chemicals called histamines. Histamines are going to dilate our blood vessels and increase blood flow to the damaged area. Our blood vessels also become more permeable. So in step one of tissue repair, we get bleeding at the site of injury, and then our mast cells release histamine, causing our blood vessels to dilate and increase blood flow to the area. And finally, our blood vessels are also going to become more permeable. On to step two. In step two, a blood clot forms. This blood clot is going to trap any 
loose debris that may have made it into the wound. It traps any bacteria that may have been introduced to the wound and it also captures cellular debris. This prevents any of these materials from making it into our bloodstream or wandering through our tissue where they can do damage. Beneath this scab, macrophages that have migrated towards the area of the wound begin to phagocytize our dead or damaged cells along with cellular debris and any of those foreign particles that may have made it into the wound. Along with the scab, this helps protect our body from any of that material wandering around in our tissue and making it into the bloodstream where it can cause trouble. Now there's one more thing that we need to look at on this picture, and it's these migrating epithelial cells. So cells from the epidermis, in this case because we're looking at skin, are going to begin to migrate down the sides of our scab and then they're going to come together at the bottom to form a solid epithelium. With an unbroken epithelium, our skin can go back to being a solid barrier and protecting our insides from the outside world. In step three, we can see our dermis is regenerating and also going through a little bit of fibrosis with the help of fibroblasts. These new fibroblasts are creating new extracellular fibers to begin to fill in the area of the wound, which we can see as this cross hatching on our diagram. As our fibroblasts produce new extracellular material, this is going to push our epithelium upwards and it's pushing our scab upwards slowly as we rebuild what is underneath. As this continues, our scab will fall away and you may have a slight indention in your skin and if you look at this picture you may see that we've got a few um, less layers of stratum corneum than we may have in other areas and that causes us, us to have a little dimple. That dimple is not necessarily permanent, it depends on the injury and we see scar tissue underneath. So in this process of tissue repair in the skin, we see both regeneration of our epithelium and we see fibrosis of our dermis. So both of those are occurring. Before we are completely done talking about tissue repair, I want to talk about inflammation. Inflammation is a stereotyped response to injury or infection. Please keep in mind that injury and infection, while they seem like they are related, don't always happen together. You can have an injury without that injury getting infected and you can have an infection without having an injury. So I want you to think of a sunburn. A sunburn is an injury in which you will get inflammation but it does not signify an infection. Whereas you can have a cold which would signify an infection without actually being injured. Here on our picture we have an example of inflammation and let's say that this person got stung by a bee on their foot. It's a great place to get stung by a bee. This injury has caused inflammation and we can see this inflammation has some common characteristics and it happens the exact same way every single time it happens. That is what we mean by stereotyped. Stereotyped means it occurs at the exact same way every single time. And what we see when we look at inflammation here from our bee sting is we see our four cardinal signs of inflammation. 
We see redness. We see swelling. If you feel that area, it might feel hot. And whether or not you are touching or pushing on the area, you may feel pain. So over here, our Greek guys are showing us our four cardinal signs of inflammation. Heat, we got some fire going. Redness, he's pretty embarrassed his toga fell down. Swelling, that should be obvious enough. And pain, looks like he has stubbed his toe. Now let's take a look at why we get these four cardinal signs of inflammation. So if we take a look at our next picture, it shows us the steps of the inflammatory response. So here is our bee stinger. Stinger has come in and it has pierced our skin. For some reason, we made the bee angry. He stung us. So the first thing that happens, and I don't know if you guys can read this, is that our damaged tissues release histamines and our histamines are going to increase blood flow to the area. This may be reminiscent of step one where we had histamines that were dilating our blood vessels which increases our blood flow and causes our blood vessels to become more permeable. So if we take a look at our blood vessel here, here's our blood vessel wall. You can see our blood vessel wall flares outwards in our picture because our blood vessel has dilated. To dilate means to have a greater diameter. This is going to increase blood flow to the area and as we can see our blood vessel wall is becoming leaky. Fluid is going to move out of our blood vessel as well as macrophages. So these guys here are macrophages and they are moving from the blood into our tissues in a process called diapedesis. Then our macrophages are doing what macrophages do best and they are phagocytizing any foreign particles that make it into our wound. So with that increase in blood flow and the increase of flow into our tissue from our blood vessel, we see swelling. So our swelling is due to our blood vessel becoming more permeable and fluid and cells leaving our blood vessel. If you remember, erythrocytes are the red blood cells and the prefix erythro means red. So as we increase blood flow to this area, we are increasing the number of erythrocytes, which makes that area red. And along with all of that blood comes the heat that we store in our body. So all three of these cardinal signs are caused by an increase in blood flow. Then with all of the fluid that is leaving our blood vessels and we've got these white blood cells leaving our blood vessels, the area of the wound quickly becomes very crowded and our swelling causes our pain. So the fluid that is entering the tissue pushes against our nerve endings which stimulates the nerve endings and it registers as pain. And that sums up our inflammatory response. So I want to take you back to that very first picture that we looked at. Here we have a pin or we could say we have a bee stinging us and causing a breach in our skin. We're going to see chemical signals released by mast cells. This is going to cause our blood vessels to dilate and to become more leaky. Fluids are going to enter the area of our wound along with our white blood cells. We are going to begin to form a clot, so clotting begins. And our macrophages are going to clean up all of our cellular debris that we see here. And then our fibroblasts are going to come in and they're going to rebuild this tissue until 
it is back to normal. So there we have the processes of tissue repair and a short introduction to inflammation.